What's going on everybody? It's Greg Peters with the Car Passion Channel and over the last couple videos I discovered that my Miata's 500 horsepower engine had three broken main caps. So today I will be continuing the tear down to the bare block on this machine and inspecting all the parts to see if I find anything else interesting. Now you may have noticed that I'm wearing my trusty What's Dang shirt in order to motivate myself to get my car back on the road as soon as possible. And it just so happens that I got another run of these shirts in and I have all sizes available on my website right now. So in case you missed the first run, now's your chance to get it because I'm probably not gonna do another run of these shirts. And if you hate the shirts, that's okay. Do you still wanna support the free content that I put out on an almost weekly basis? You can buy me a gallon of E85 as well, which I'm gonna be burning a lot of when I get this motor back in the car. But anyways, the links to both of those items will be down below in the description. Thank you guys for your support, and now let's jump into the disassembly. The first thing I needed to do was flip the engine back over to remove the cylinder head, so I put a main cap back in place to make sure the crankshaft was secured. Well, I tried to put a main cap back on, and that's when I realized that the ARP studs actually bent as a result of the cap breaking. See how this stud is lined up with this hole, but if I move over to the other side it's way off center? I wasn't planning on reusing these anyways, but I just thought it was interesting. Later in the video I'll investigate just how bent these studs are. So I secured cap number 4 here and flipped the engine back over. Now it's time for a run of the mill head removal that I've covered here on the channel multiple times, but let's run through it real quick anyways. If you have an 01 to 05 engine, you'll need to remove the VVT equipment first. Once that's out of the way, you can remove your ignition system followed by your valve cover. Remove the upper timing cover, then remove the alternator belt by loosening the alternator tensioner. Just crack this 12 millimeter bolt loose first, then loosen the tensioner bolt until you can remove the belt. Now of course I forgot to loosen the water pump pulley bolts before taking the belt off, but if you forget that, you can actually use the belt to hold the pulley in place while you loosen the bolts. It's much easier with an impact, but as long as your bolts aren't over torqued, you should be able to loosen them using this technique with a ratchet. Now remove the middle timing cover, which gives you access to the timing belt tensioner. Loosen the 14mm bolt and remove the spring with pliers, then pull the belt off of the cam gears. If you have a water neck or any lines here, it's also a good time to remove those and get them out of the way. Next, loosen up the exhaust manifold, and any part that's secured with multiple bolts or nuts, I always loosen them in stages and with some kind of cross pattern. Some parts are more crucial than others to do this on, but it certainly doesn't hurt anything. Once the exhaust manifold is out of the way, you can move on to the intake side. Remove all of the nuts and make sure there are no lines or wires connecting the manifold to the engine and then pull it off. I like to remove the cam gears prior to pulling the head just because it's easier than doing it on a workbench. If you have a VVT engine, first you'll need to remove the T25 bolts on the front of the intake gear and very carefully because I'm pretty sure these are made out of melted down Coke cans. I keep telling myself I'm going to replace these but just end up reinstalling the old ones every time, lowering their health bar slightly with each use. Use a crescent wrench to hold the cams in place while you loosen the cam gear bolts, and then remove the gears from the cams. Whether or not you remove the cams at this time is totally up to you since you have full access to the hardware that secures the head in place either way. And these need to be loosened using an inward spiral pattern starting with the outermost bolts, the exact opposite of the torquing pattern. Once all the hardware is loose, remove that powerhouse from the cylinder block and set it aside. <laughs> yes, dude. Yes. Hold on, let me get some better light on this. Okay, there was one thing that had me worried about doing this teardown video and posting it because you guys know I show everything, I'm as transparent as possible, and I want you to know that if I made some sort of major mistake and that's what caused something on my car to fail, I want to teach others about I'm not I'm not ashamed because I made a mistake. A lot of this stuff is my first time doing it. So I don't really think it's that big of a deal. But what I was worried about is that I was gonna pull the cylinder head and the piston tops would be covered in detonation marks. Then of course, everyone would think the reason the caps broke is because of some monumental detonation. But it appears that is not the case. Take a look at these things. Look at these things, man, clean. Cylinder number one is what I was most worried about because that's the most damage happened right under cylinder number one. Probably the best looking piston of all of them. So yes, I was afraid that I absolutely had the thing cranked up too high and I detonated it to death. But from everything I can see 
it doesn't look like that's the case. Everything from the data log of that pole where intake temps were just barely cresting 100 degrees Fahrenheit, that Fab9 intercooler really keeping the air temperature under control, but it looks like the tune was good and it was just a matter of making too much torque at too low of an RPM or just too much torque in general and the, I reached the strength limit of those main caps. Now, I know that this engine is tuned, it's tuned to the limit basically, and not just from a horsepower standpoint, I'm more talking about trying to get as much horsepower as it has from the size turbo that I'm using. I'm pushing a lot of boost through a pretty small turbo. I'm actually over spinning it a little bit to get above that 500 horsepower number. And I'm running an absolute ton of ignition timing, even for E85. And I wouldn't recommend that anyone else tune their engine the way that I have this thing tuned both electronically and mechanically with the part selection and how much boost and power it's running. I would also never tune someone else's engine the way that this thing is tuned. Everyone just needs to be very aware that this engine is a total test bed. I'm really pushing the limits on it to try to find those weaknesses. And it's kind of part of the fun for me and I get the experience of not only learning, but being able to push a platform very hard and then share with tens of thousands of people this information and everyone gets to learn from it. Everybody gets to build faster Miatas. Anyways, let's continue with the teardown and then I'll talk about my strategy uh, with the rebuild, with the machine shop, what parts need to go to the machine shop, because I know there's a lot of confusion around that. If you're building an engine at home, what does the machine shop need? What do I tell them? And I also get to show off my Mozworks billet main caps because they just showed up in the mail. So you'll see that in just a few minutes, but let's go ahead and continue tearing this engine down to the block. Now this part is painful. I'm removing my SCE cut ring head gasket, which I will be replacing. It's probably only got about 500 miles on it and they cost $200. However, in my opinion, it's just not worth the risk of trying to reuse it. But wait, there's more. Because of the grooved fire ring design of the gasket, each time the cylinder head is removed, it needs to be shaved by a few thousandths of an inch by a machine shop since the fire rings leave grooves in the head once it's torqued down. It's kind of a bummer because otherwise I would just set the head aside until the block was done being built, but it's just part of having a gasket that seals so well. Back over on the engine, it's time to remove the coolant inlet pipe, VVT oil supply line, which also has my turbo oil supply teed into it for anyone wondering what that weird little block is, and the oil filter and sandwich plate. Next up is the alternator, which is just a top and bottom bolt lower timing cover, and the timing belt tensioner and idler, followed by the four bolts that hold the water pump on. If you have head studs rather than the stock head bolts, those can be removed at this time also, and you're done with the top of the engine. The pistons and rods can come out next, so start by loosening the rod caps, again in stages, and once the bolts are out, they might take a little tap to come loose, Make sure you're using a rubber mallet here so you don't damage the connecting rod. So here it looks like the bottom half of the bearing is relatively healthy, but the top half is actually what gets subjected to the forces of combustion, so I'll see how those look in just a minute. The crankshaft journal looks fine in my opinion, and I think a polish from a machine shop will make it look like new again. That's after they verify that the crank isn't bent and doesn't have any fractures, which I am still a little bit worried about. Once the rod cap is off, you can push the entire assembly out of the bore. Now it is best practice to put something protective on the end of the rod so it doesn't scratch the cylinder wall, but I just remove them very slowly and carefully, knowing that the cylinders are going to need to be freshened up anyways, or possibly even bored out to a larger size. Follow that same procedure with the rest of the pistons and rods, dropping them out and setting them aside for safekeeping. So these were the bearing halves that I was really interested in seeing, and it looks like three of them have worn completely through the top layer. Now at first, after seeing this, I wasn't very happy, thinking that even though the engine does make a lot of power, I really hope the bearing life isn't only 15,000 miles. And since the pistons didn't really show any major detonation signs, that means these bearings were really only subjected to relatively normal forces. But consider this. Imagine these are in the engine still and the main caps are sitting in place. Now the caps that broke were here, here, and here. These two caps remained intact. Notice how the number four bearing is significantly healthier than the rest, and that's most likely because that's the only rod that was supported by two main caps. The other bearings most likely wore out super fast due to the extreme vibration they were subjected to after the main cap failure. 
There's really no way to prove that, of course, but to me, it's kind of just what makes the most sense. Anyways, it's enough CSI on these bearings. I'm gonna be using new ones anyways, but I'm also trying to find out as much as I can about the conditions inside the engine over its life so I can learn and rebuild this thing with the highest possible quality. Taking a closer look at the pistons, they do have some wear areas. I mean, obviously they're not gonna look like I just pulled them out of the box. They have a few tiny marks on top, but some professional opinions I got are rather than detonation, it actually looks like there were a few particles of something that got sucked through the engine, which is also completely possible. I'd really like to use these pistons again so I don't have to buy another set, but I haven't quite decided on that yet. Anyways, let's get on with finishing up this teardown. To loosen the crank pulley, I threaded a couple flywheel bolts in and put a pry bar between them to secure the crank in place, and I also put two of the rear main caps back on to hold the crank down. Next I installed the puller, and don't even think about using a jaw type puller on a super damper. You never want to apply any force that can pull the inner and outer portions away from each other. Once the pulley and crankshaft are separated, the oil pump can be accessed. I think the oil pump is still okay because the engine actually had oil pressure after the failure, but I'm still going to ship this thing out to Boundary Engineering for an inspection just to be on the safe side. Next you have the four 10mm bolts that hold the rear main seal carrier to the block. Remove your main caps if you haven't already, of course untorquing in stages, and the crankshaft will be ready for removal. But first I want to check the thrust clearance since that was one of your guys most popular guesses on what caused this failure to begin with. So those down there are the thrust bearings, and you can see when I push the crankshaft forward and backwards, it does actually move a tiny bit. That is the thrust clearance. When I originally assembled this engine, the thrust clearance was about six thousandths. So now I can check what the clearance is now and see how much these have worn. Or I'm really looking to see how much the rear one has worn because that's the one that takes all the abuse when you put your foot on the clutch pedal. And there is your answer, six thousandths of thrust clearance, which means these bearings have approximately zero wear. Now you can remove the crankshaft and be very careful, especially if you still have the main studs in your block because you do not want to scratch the journals on the crankshaft. This essentially completes the teardown, but I did find something interesting with the front main bearings after removing the crankshaft. So each bearing half has a tang on it, and this is to locate the bearing halves in the engine during the assembly process. The tang butts up to either the block or the main cap depending on if it's the upper or lower half. Take a look at the tang on the front main bearing compared to the rear. See how the healthy tang is like a little ramp or wedge shape, and the other one looks like the metal of the tang was actually pushed downwards? That's what a bearing looks like when it's about to spin, or technically this one was already partially spun. That tang right there was the only thing keeping the bearing in place, since the main cap was no longer putting any pressure on it, and that bit sticking up shows exactly how much the bearing had spun. The reason spun bearings are kind of a big deal is shown right here. Watch what happens when I spin this just a little bit more. The oil supply port for the bearing gets completely cut off. If that happens in a running engine, it's pretty much RIP. The last thing I needed to do here was remove the main studs, which normally isn't really that exciting, but in this case it was actually pretty fun. So here's what a normal stud looks like coming out of the block. Nice and straight. And this is what the front three sets look like. Boy, these things are more bent out of shape than a Mustang owner that just got pulled on by a Miata. And it looks like I'm gonna have to do another run of motivational moving parts here pretty soon. It's funny, I'm reading your guys' comments on my last Instagram post and everyone's debating over like what the best engine swap should be for the red car. J swap, K swap, LS swap, one point s I'm not even gonna read that one out loud. But anyways, in my mind, I haven't even thought about an engine swap because the BP is what belongs in the red car. It's what's going back into the red car. It's gonna crank out horsepower and it's gonna be great. Anyways, let's talk about some machine shop things. So if you're in the bare block state of your build and you're ready to go to the machine shop, there's a lot of confusion around what you need to tell them, what parts you need to bring them. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of the more confusing things. Number one, if you're getting your block bored to have bigger pistons, if you're going even a half of a millimeter above stock size diameter pistons, you have to get the block bored. You can't just hone it. If you're leaving stock pistons, you'll get your block honed. If you're going bigger, you'll get it bored. So let's say you have 84 millimeter pistons, which are plus one millimeter from stock. That's what I have in this engine. You don't just go to the machine shop and say, I need my cylinders bored to 84 millimeters. That doesn't give them what they need. You actually need to bring the pistons that are going into that block and they're gonna machine your block according to the exact size of those pistons. What if they're 84.05 millimeters? What if they're not, you know, and pistons also are oval. I don't know if you knew that, they're not round. 
So the block has to be machined a very specific way to the exact piston that's going in it. So you got to provide your pistons. If you want the machine shop to line bore the mains or set up your bearing clearances, they need your bearings. Nine times out of 10, you're just gonna use standard bearings. In fact, in this engine, I had standard bearings. Now that I've taken all the bearings out of it and I can see that there was some wear, but no damage, you know, nothing's completely wrecked. I know that I can order all standard size main and rod bearings and a new set of thrust bearings. And I'm gonna bring those to the machine shop and tell them what clearances I want when they do a line bore on my new mains, which I'll show you what those look like in just a second. I have a feeling they're gonna be sick, but I haven't even opened the box yet. As far as your cylinder head goes, if you're using your original valve train, you might not need a valve job. The valves might just need to be lapped in. If you're putting brand new valves in the head, you still might not need a valve job. And a lot of times, brand new aftermarket valves have a special hardened coating on them. And if you get a valve job where they cut the valve, you're cutting that hardened surface off. So they might just need to be lapped in, which basically means the seat and the valve already have the correct angle to meet up with each other. They just need a little bit kind of shaved off to seal properly. That time they can also set up the lash in your head or your valve lash. And most machine shops, what they'll do is machine the tips of all the valves until the lash is correct. So they're not worrying about like swapping shims around or ordering new shims. Some shops will actually machine the existing shims, um, but you know, there's different ways to do that. A lot of times the cylinder head will just need a basic resurface, which is cutting just a couple thousandths off of it to give it a fresh sealing surface to make sure that there's no leaks. You can get a head shave where you take extra material off to raise your compression, but don't forget you will be changing the piston to valve clearance if you shave the head. So you can check out my video on how to measure your piston to valve clearance if you're thinking about doing that procedure. And I think that covers most of the confusing basics. If you have any specific questions, you can drop them down in the comment section below. Also, since I'm putting new main caps on the engine, I have to have a procedure done called a line bore where they basically run a giant drill bit through all the mains to make sure they're perfectly straight and perfectly sized, therefore giving you good bearing clearances. I'll also have the machine shop inspect my cylinder walls and tell me if they're healthy enough to just be honed. In that case, I'll be able to use the original pistons that I have. I'll just throw a new set of piston rings on them. Or if the machine shop tells me, you know what, the cylinder walls are just a little bit too worn to be honed, it should really be bored. In that case, I'll have to buy a set of 84 and a half millimeter pistons, half a millimeter bigger than what I have now, with 84 and a half millimeter piston rings, which they're included, but that's why I haven't bought the rings yet because I don't know if I'll be reusing my same pistons. But that's something that I will let the professionals decide. I have put together somewhat of a list over here, uh, things I wanna fix on my chassis, parts that I need to order, some of which I have already, some of which I don't know if I'm gonna need to order or not. And then something I call the procedure list where I just put kind of in order what I need to do. So today I did full teardown. Obviously I need new main studs and mains. So I'm still waiting on the studs. I can't install the mains yet. Block then needs to go to the machine shop. They'll check out that crankshaft. I'll see if it's good. If it's bad, I gotta find a new crankshaft, uh, et cetera. Cylinder's good. If they're bad, I gotta buy bigger pistons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's kind of an ongoing list. Maybe I'll think up more things, whatever. But the main point is here, you wanna stay organized with your build and find things out early rather than later. The last thing you wanna do is get to the assembly phase and realize that you have to order a part that's gonna take one or two weeks to get and it holds up your project. And this is all about getting the Miata back on the road as quick as possible. So I wanna stay organized. So Mozworks was generous enough to send me out a set of their billet main caps. And in exchange, I promise to advise the world of high powered BPs that this is something you should consider. Notice how I said high power. If you're building a 300 wheel horsepower BP, you do not need these, don't buy them. But if you're making big power, 450, 500 plus horsepower, this is something that you do want to invest in. The Mozworks is considering discontinuing these because they say nobody buys them, but it seems every year people are building higher and higher horsepower Miata engines. And I get the feeling that people are actually going to start wanting these. And it would be nice to have a product like this on the shelf, ready for people who want to join the big dogs. Well, it's a box and a box and a box. Oh, 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 oh my God, these things are beef.
So in case it's not obvious, the main difference between these caps against the stock units is the material they're made from. Stock caps are cast iron, which means they're created by pouring molten iron into a cast. Cheap and easy to manufacture, with overall strength being the compromise. The Mosworks caps, on the other hand, are machined out of a solid block of 4140 chromoly steel. Now I'm not sure what the exact percent difference in strength is between the two materials, but these caps certainly have some heft to them. You can see they're roughly the same size as the stock caps, but check out the weight difference. And that really shows how much more dense the material is. As a side note, SPS Motorsport in Germany also includes these caps in all of their Stage 3 engine builds and recommends them to anyone running over 400 wheel horsepower or 22 PSI. Now I don't have my main studs yet, but I can still give these caps a test fit and they look absolutely marvelous on this BP block. Big time 2JZ vibes. Looking closely, you can see that the new caps are made very slightly smaller than the original diameter, and that's so they can be machined up to the perfect size for the bearing clearance you need. All right, guys, well, that's all I have for you on this beautiful Miata Monday. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. And another huge shout out to Mozworks for sending me a set of their billet caps. I promise I'll be putting them to good use. If you want to check out a set for yourself, I have them linked down below in the description. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you're new here. And as always, I will catch you in the next one. Peace out.